All right, and I'll reintroduce myself. So hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Barnett with Aljoya Thornton Place. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to briefly highlight the partnership that Era Living shares with the, the University of Washington School of Nursing. We are very proud of the unique and special relationship we've shared with the University of Washington School of Nursing for nearly 30 years. Through our ongoing collaboration, we have developed evidence-based programs such as our Thrive Program, which directly benefit our residents, and we continue to support and to participate in research with the Detournier Center for Healthy Aging at the School of Nursing. This partnership also allows us um, access to phenomenal presenters like who we are about to hear from today, who share their knowledge and research on a variety of topics, surrounding healthy aging. Um, if you would like to hear more about this special partnership, how it benefits our residents, how we use it in our community, or if you'd simply like to learn more about Aljoya, I would be happy to talk with you after today's, um, today's presentation. So with that being said, I am delighted to introduce to you today's speaker, Dr. Basha Belza, who is the Aljoya Endowed Professor in Aging in the School of Nursing at the University of Washington. Dr. Belza is also the director of the De Tournier Center for Healthy Aging at the University of Washington School of Nursing and is an adjunct professor with the School of Public Health. So she has joined us today to present Work Out Your Brain with Physical Activity. So without further ado, I will hand this over. I'll go ahead and... Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much for that introduction. And it's really my pleasure to be with you today. It's great to see all of you who have uh, signed in to uh, spend the next hour with us uh, talking about uh, working out uh, your brain uh, with physical activity. And as Michelle introduced me, I am um, affiliated um, at the University of Washington. I'm in the School of Nursing, and um, I'm very pleased to hold the Aljoya Endowed Professor of Aging. I'm also the director of our Detourney Center for Healthy Aging, in which we uh, both uh, support uh, uh, research as well as uh, training and clinical um, opportunities around healthy aging. Okay. So what I'm hoping to do today is um, talk a little bit about healthy aging, uh, talk um, predominantly about what the benefits are of physical activity, um, and I'm going to weave in the concept of the sitting epidemic. I'm not sure if it's something you're familiar with, but it is something that we are experiencing even all the more so during our pandemic talk a little bit about barriers to being physically active, and then share with you uh, two examples of work that our teams have been involved in uh, related to mall walking, as well as an exercise program called Enhanced Fitness. And then I'm very curious to see what you all are interested in doing as far as your own physical activity uh, levels. Um, at some points in time, I would welcome any of your participation in the chat feature. Although I just realized, Michelle, I can't see chat when my slides are up. That's interesting. Ah, yes, I can. Okay. You can. Okay. There we go. Okay. Okay. Um, just want to make sure everybody can um, see me. Uh, if, you, if you can, wave your hand. Um, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me then. Anybody, uh, can you all hear me okay? Thumbs up. Wonderful. Great, great, great. Okay. So let's first look at really what we see as a definition of healthy aging. You know, really when we think about it, we wanna look at both the development of how we develop and then also our maintenance and really looking at it as both a physical, a mental, and a social well-being, as well as our physical functioning. That those are all really important components of healthy aging. And we at the Detourney Center actually have as a concept pathways to healthy aging because we really feel strongly that aging doesn't start at 50 or 60 or 70. It's really the activities and the commitments and the environments that we live in as children and how we're um, brought up. Um, and so really the kinds of supports that we give our great-grandchildren, our children, and our grandchildren all really are important in, in their own um, healthy aging process then. 
So we do know from the research is that um, individuals who are able to age healthily really is achieved by in healthy environments and communities that are safe, um, but also environments then that support the adoption and maintenance of both attitudes, how we think about aging, but also our behaviors that help promote health and well-being. It also includes our ability to access health services so as to maintain our health, to really focus on health promotion, and then help us manage any of our acute and chronic conditions. So we're really looking at healthy aging from a large perspective there. So why talk about physical activity? Well, this is a very interesting time to be talking about physical activity, um, both based on the pandemic we're facing, but also uh, all the wildfires um, that um, the forest fires that are uh, continuing to persist that are really challenging us as far as the air quality. Um, so, but why talk about physical activity? Well, when I had decided upon this topic several weeks ago, we really look at it because the majority of our healthcare money is actually used to prevent and treat chronic diseases that are linked to our lifestyle behaviors. They are linked to the choices we make about how active or inactive we are. And interesting enough, the research tells us again and again that the single behavior older adults can do to positively impact your health status is to engage in regular physical activity. It's really incredible that the research shows that consistently. And although we know many of us do our best at staying active, we encourage our family and friends to do it. The statistics are there that many older adults are not physically active adequately or they're physically inactive. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. It's just we need to be able to figure out how we can stay the most physically active as possible based on our own function and uh, interest levels. So when we look at the research, it's just incredible for those of you that are able to see the slide to look at what the benefits are. And every part of our physical and psychological status is positively affected by regular physical activity. So we know that it reduces the risk of heart disease by 40%, lowers the risk of stroke by almost 30%. It reduces the incidence of diabetes type two by 50%. It reduces the incidence of high blood pressure by 50%. It reduces the mortality and risk of recurrent breast cancer, of colon cancer, of developing Alzheimer's. And other than physiologically, psychologically, we also know physical activity can reduce depression as effective as medication such as Prozac or any kind of behavioral therapy. So we also know that a good physical activity program that involves balance, that involves strength, that involves aerobic activity, also can help reduce our risk for falls. And as we age, many of us are very fearful of falls. So being able to have physical activity that improves our strength and balance will help reduce that risk of falls. So, where does that put us then? Well, what are the ways that you can keep your brain healthy as you age? So I'm wondering if any of you are comfortable putting on the chat feature things that you can do to keep your brain healthy. The chat feature should be along the bottom toolbar there. And if you click on chat, you can actually write in something that you think keeps your brain healthy. I don't know, Michelle, or Stephanie, if you want to start us off. Um, let's see. So someone has put in Sudoku. Okay, so first of all, I commend you on finding the chat feature, and you've actually put in an answer there, Sudoku. Okay, so what are other things that you can think of that can keep your brain healthy as we age? Walks, really good, very important, walks. As much as we can take for granted walking, walking can be very helpful for our brain health. Puzzles and other brain engaging activities. So someone's put in walks, 
every day, but how much? And we can talk about that in a little bit. That's really important. Yes, walking is one of the most valuable things we can do for our health. And we'll talk in a little bit about how much we need. Anything else that you can think about as far as ways to keep your brain healthy as you age? Okay, well, let's go on to the next slide. And here you'll see a list of seven ways to keep your brain healthy. We're gonna be focusing on one of them, but I think it's a good reminder to think about what are the things that we're doing to keep our brain healthy. So one is building our cognitive reserve. And we do that by learning new things, such as learning a new language. We need to monitor our blood sugar, okay? Diabetes is linked with a higher risk of dementia. So we need to figure out how to monitor our blood sugar and watch our diets. Keeping our blood pressure within the recommended range, range is really important. You know, blood pressure damages blood vessels in the brain. Aerobic exercise, and this is where the predominant part of my discussion today is on how physical activity really helps our brain form new connections. We need to protect our head against brain injury. So the better things that we can do to protect our head, whether that's really helping reduce falls, whether that means wearing a helmet if we are riding a bicycle, whether that means really protecting it in any kind of activities we're doing. Also watching our sugar and our refined carbs, and then actually making sure that you get enough B vitamins. So vitamin B12, which is found in food like fish and meat, poultry and milk. And if you're a vegetarian, it can be in fortified cereals, but making sure we have enough vitamin B12. So of these seven ways to help our brain stay healthy, I'm gonna focus on this one, on this one about exercise and how that can help our brain health. So I want to share with you a couple of slides about what is the connection then between our lifestyle choices and dementia. And this is where it's incredible as far as the amount of research. One study found in which they followed over 2,000 men over 30 years. Okay, they tracked, these men tracked, uh, activities such as smoking, um, what their height and weight balance was, their body mass index, their fruit and vegetable intake, their physical activity, as well as their alcohol intake. Looking at all these different kinds of lifestyle choices, and what the researchers found is that those men who adopted four or five of these behaviors were less likely to develop cognitive impairment and dementia. So the better your lifestyle choices are, the more likely you are gonna have less problems with cognitive impairment. So we know healthy lifestyle is really associated with uh, less cognitive impairment, but we also know that not everybody lives in that lifestyle. The other interesting finding here is what does physical activity do to our brain? So we can know that physical activity may really make our muscles store. It may help us be more alert. But look at these other things that it does more subtly. The positive effects on brain health occurs at all stages of the lifespan. So young, middle, old age. And what it does is it enhances our cognition. It gives us protection against neurodegenerative order, disorders, such as Alzheimer's disease. But it also helps reduce psychological conditions. These are things such as mood disorders and anxiety. So think about this physical activity that affects on your brain, both physical and psychological then. It also helps with neurotropic factors. These are really small proteins, and these help support our neurons in our brain. It helps with reducing um, stress and inflammation, which are important for our brain health. And it also promotes neuroplasticity. Well, what is that? That is the ability of our brain to continually adapt throughout our lifespan. So we want this. Neuroplasticity is good because we want to be able to adapt as we're faced with new situations, new challenges. Very important roles that physical activity plays. And here's one other study I wanted to share with you is in which those people who are less active across one's adulthood 
there's an increased risk of late life cognitive impairment. Okay, and that's been shown in a number of studies. And again, if we think about modifiable risk factors, physical activity is one of them, but also hypertension, obesity, diabetes, depression, smoking, and low education. Many of these are things that we can do based on the lifestyle choices we make. So of all these risk factors, physical inactivity actually conveys the greatest risk to our cognitive decline. So again, really important, the role that physical activity helps with our cognitive functioning. Interesting enough, the risk factors really are dependent upon each other. And so engagement in, for example, midlife activity actually may slow or prevent your cognitive decline. And so there is a strong interrelationship between being physically active, helping your brain, but also helping reduce perhaps obesity, helping to manage diabetes or reduce your blood sugar there, helping your blood pressure be more along normal lines, as well as helping your psychological status. So again, a fair amount of research supporting the role of exercise in the brain. And here I just wanted to point out that when we exercise, our brain is stimulated and it helps release growth factors. So these are chemicals in the brain that affect the health of our brain cells. Really strong there. So we know it also helps our mood. It can help our sleep as long as we're not, muscles aren't too sore, helps reduce our stress and anxiety. I've heard a number of people who are doing things as physical activity to help the stress and anxiety associated with the pandemic. The parts of the brain then that control our thinking really are in the prefrontal cortex and the medial temporal cortex. And what they found is that these areas have greater volume in people who exercise. So I'm curious to know, now again from the chat, what kinds of things do you feel when you're exercising? Whether you be walking, whether you're being sitting on a stationary bicycle, whether you're swimming, what kinds of benefits are you feeling? And if you wanna go ahead and type that in the chat, that would be great. And if Stephanie or Michelle, you want to start us off, that's helpful too. What benefits do you feel when you exercise, when you go for a walk, when you do some chair exercises? Okay, someone mentioned being more cheerful, being more interested in other people, excellent. Someone else mentioned it helps with stress. Anything else that you feel when you are physically active? Oh, very interesting. So someone's arthritis pain is actually less after exercising. Very good. So one's arthritis pain may not always be exacerbated, but actually may feel better. I think some people who swim feel much more relaxed as far as their joints go. Someone else mentioned they are reminded about how important deep breathing is. Very good, thank you. Thank you for those contributions in the chat. That's really good to hear from all of you. Okay, let's move on a bit here. Now, I think it's really important to remember, and this is what our newest research has shown, that's really not new. I think we've known it all along, but we're trying to combine it that what is good for your heart, the choices you're making for your heart as far as good nutrition, such as healthy diets, such as less stress, actually are good for your brain too. I think we have in the past too much focused on the heart, but realize that our brain actually benefits too then. Okay, so this moves us talking a little bit more specifically about physical activity. And this is the question I love to ask. What is the one prescription that can prevent and treat dozens of diseases? What do you think that is? The one prescription that really can prevent and treat dozens of chronic conditions, both for young and middle-aged and older adults. Okay, physical activity, yes. So 
physical activity is that one prescription that really can treat dozens of diseases. And we saw that in one of the earlier slides there. So someone did ask about how much walking do you actually need? Well, we, when we look at uh, the American Society for Sports Medicine, we look at their physical activity recommendations. They do have some for across the ages. I wanted to first start with two very important concepts. Is overall thinking move more and sit less. That is really critical when we think about how much physical activity we need. We need more than yesterday, and we need more than what we're doing now as far as sitting in our chairs. So if you can listen to this webinar and stand up, that's great. If you need to sit, that's okay too. But whatever, after this webinar, if you can go and walk around your apartment, up and down your, um, back and forth to your room, to your living room, that's really good too. Some activity is better than none. So I think too frequently we think, oh, I can't go for a walk because I don't have time or I need to get down to dinner. Even if you can do a short walk, that's better than no walk at all. So really important things to do is move more and sit less. If you love to watch a TV, get up during commercials. Um, some activity is better than none. So remember that you can always get in a little if it's not your full uh, scope of physical activity that you wanna do. As far as the recommendations, when we talk about how much do we need, for general health, we need 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity activity. Now this is gonna vary based on what your own physical status is, but if you're thinking about it, that's about 30 minutes a day on most days of the week. And moderate intensity is where you can push yourself but still be safe. So you don't wanna push yourself where you're gonna start having chest pain, you don't wanna push yourself where you may fall, you wanna push yourself so that you're gonna to have to be taking some deep breaths there. Um, you might be uh, walking a little bit faster than usual, but again, to the point of still where you're safe. For older adults in particular, it's important that not only do you have some moderate intensity activity, but you also do some muscle strengthening activities. And this may mean some weight lifting with people who are supervising you. It may mean lifting up a can of tomatoes. It's not always just weights that you can use to actually um, do some strengthening. Maybe doing some um, leg lifts while you're sitting in a chair. And then balance training is the other thing that's really important as far as doing some balance exercises, usually two to three times a week, um, so as to improve your balance. So those are what usually is recommended then. I want to go over what our history has been as far as mankind. When we actually look at how we got to where we are as far as the amount of sitting. So we have a long history of how our forefathers worked in the fields. Uh, they worked, they did not sit. Uh, they were um, out in the forest collecting foods. They were out in the water fishing. And it's really only been more recently that we have really sat down and spent a lot more time sitting in our chairs. And I think it's important that we realize that sitting actually is a health risk. And for some people, it is as bad as smoking, excessive drinking, and junk food. I mean, think about that. That that which we do as far as our sitting epidemic, it is as bad as smoking, excessive drinking, and junk food. And we do know the sedentary lifestyle of ours really does increase our risk for a number of comorbid conditions, such as heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, obesity, and early death. So something really too important, uh, important to think about with daily routines and how we can incorporate physical activity more into it. And this is where I wanted to bring in a new concept, newer. When we think about epidemics, we're really scared of them. So I think we need to think about our sitting epidemic, that really the sofas and our chairs really should carry a health warning. We have health warning on cigarettes. Why shouldn't our chairs and sofas also carry a health warning. Really beware of the chair. And it's actually a fascinating history. Really not until really the late Middle Ages, people who sat in chairs were really only high rankers, as they were called. They were only the kings and the bishops. And actually the chairs they sat in, they had no backs. They were really only stools. So the backs of chairs only came into existence until about the 13th century. 
And really only until the 16th century were they really even more common in the workplace. But it wasn't really a big fad initially because people who sat were considered slackers. So it's really only more recently in the 19th century that we've really seen our offices have many more chairs. And so you can see how this then has become a much more of an epidemic then as we've had more chairs to sit in and to then have an epidemic around them. So I wanted to ask you now, why is it so hard to exercise even when we know it's so good for us? We know it's good for our health, but why is it so hard to exercise in? And someone wanted to remind us that sitting is the new smoking. Yes, I'm gonna have you give this talk next time. Yes, sitting is the new smoking. So why is it so hard? Someone says it hurts. Yes, it can be painful to exercise. It can be painful to do certain exercises. And some people find it painful to do all exercises. So there may be pain associated with it. Good, someone else mentioned lack of motivation. Yes, it can be hard to get up and exercise by yourself. It's sometimes a little bit easier if you have a date with someone to exercise. I find it's much harder to uh, refuse someone else I've had planned to exercise than if it's just myself. But yeah, these are some good reasons why it's hard to exercise. We don't necessarily have motivation, maybe because of the pain that we feel. And someone else is mentioning that it's particularly difficult when we're isolated. So the pandemic has brought a lot of problems to our living and one of them has been in isolation. And so it's particularly difficult to exercise when we are in isolation, um, especially if we've been accustomed to exercising in groups, we've been accustomed to going out. So I, I'm really glad you brought that up. It can be difficult to exercise if you're in isolation. So someone mentions that they have a Zoom chair yoga class. So every Monday at 11 a.m., there's a chair yoga class. Great suggestion. So if you should be in isolation, you are interested in a Zoom class, that might be one of them. And maybe afterwards, Michelle, we can share um, with everybody how to get access to that information about a chair yoga class. Um, but yes, that's a way that someone could do it in isolation. Um, they also may be able to do the extent that they can uh, based on the amount of pain that they have. And someone else then brings up something that we are facing um, today, yesterday, and the last couple of weeks, and that is the unhealthy air. And I will be addressing that in a couple of minutes, but I really appreciate you bringing it up. That has really, um, if it's been problematic in the past, that has added a whole new layer um, as far as uh, the air quality index being so poor. Thank you for those uh, responses. Let me throw in some other things here. Um, so you've mentioned a number of these. Yes, we aren't necessarily motivated. Um, some of you may have caregiving obligations. Um, um, I know I recently had to care for my father and I realized the first thing that went out the window was uh, taking care of my own self as far as physical activity. Um, so sometimes caregiving obligations can uh, hamper our ability to be physically active. Um, in, in inconvenience, it may be um, difficult um, in that um, something you might want to do, let's such as swimming, it may be harder to get to. The hours may not be convenient for you. Some people don't necessarily like it. They much rather sit and read a book. Uh, they much rather knit. Uh, but they don't necessarily want to do physical activity. Lack of confidence in their ability to be physically active. Sure, um, if you've recently had a joint replacement, for example, you might not be so comfortable in figuring out how do I get walking again? How do I handle the pain? And there might be some functional limitations. So it may be that you're having some um, limitations based on um, arthritis of your hip or your knees. And then these two is what we are facing in the moment. Uh, we may be concerned with safety, including COVID-19. Uh, you may be isolated in your uh, apartment, in your room. Uh, you may not feel safe going out um, and still being able to keep uh, a distance from people. Um, and then most recently, uh, in particular in the Washington and Oregon and in 
um, California, um, we really had major problems with the environment and with the air quality index that really has um, mandated us uh, restricting ourselves even more so. Anything else that you can think of as far as barriers to being physically active? Well, I think a big question that has come up, um, and I was thinking about this as I was preparing this presentation, is, is really should I exercise during COVID-19? Um, I'd be curious to know what you all think of that. Uh, how many of you think it's okay to exercise during COVID-19? Can I see a yes or a no in the chat box? I'm gonna have one yes there. I have another yes. I have a course. I would take that as a yes, yes. So for those of you that are adding to the chat box, it looks like uh, uniformly uh, we have yes. And someone did comment, but I suppose some forms of exercise are better than others. Actually an excellent point, and I wanna build on that. So we do know that the coronavirus pandemic is disrupting every aspect of our life. And I never thought I'd be saying that in the midst of me cheerleading for physical activity, but it has impacted our exercise routines. So whether your gyms are closed, um, whether the parks around your community are closed, um, it is making it much harder to exercise if we've used those venues in the past. But we know that this exercise is important for us. We know it's important for our health. We know it, it helps prevent our weight gain. It reduces our stress and anxiety. It helps improve our sleep. So we wanna exercise, but is it safe? So I think one of the messages I wanna leave you is that we know regular moderate intensity exercise can boost our immune system. We do know that. What we don't know yet as far as the research is how exercise influences our susceptibility to COVID-19. So if we are exercising, how susceptible are we to COVID-19? That, I don't have that information for you. Um, so I think that's still un, unknown. Okay, I did wanna um, um, put up this uh, reminder, um, the fact that we are um, experiencing extremely poor air quality. I, I have to um, uh, confess to you all that I actually am not in Seattle as I'm giving this talk. I'm actually in California and have been for the last couple of weeks and have faced our own poor air quality here. But in my efforts this week, I realized that the air quality in Seattle was even worse than where I am in California. So I'm staying here in California until I see the air quality improving in Seattle. Um, I have been checking regularly um, about the air quality in Seattle. I've been looking at the pictures and I think a big question we need to ask is do the benefits of exercising and air pollution outweigh the risks? And based on what I've read, I would say no and I'm gonna tell you why. First of all, I say this very hesitantly um, because this isn't a forever. It just happens to be where we are with our air quality index today, where we are with it yesterday. It's gonna get better, but right now we are at very high risk. And why are we at high risk now? Why is the benefits of exercising not outweighing uh, these pollutants that we would be inhaling? Well, we have to remember that breathing wise, you breathe more when you exercise. So if you're taking some deeper breaths, your volume of polluted air is going to be much higher today, okay? The pollution dose also. Exercises increase the proportion of small particles that deposit in your airway. This is bad for someone who is healthy. This is bad if you have pulmonary or cardiac disease. And that your nasal defenses, if you're exercising at a high intensity, you actually switch from breathing through your nose to your mouth. So your air actually bypasses your nose where the hairs fill, act as a filter, okay? And we also know that all these smoke and particles that are in the air from these fires really can trigger asthma, bronchitis or heart attacks, as well as leading to stroke and um, impacts on chronic lung disease. So we really are needing to be careful. Um, I don't know about you all, but I've been watching this really closely. 
uh, looking at the air quality index here. And so I wanted to just put this up here um, and uh, serve as a reminder of what these different grades are as far as the air quality index. Um, I know it's getting better. It's not uh, ideal yet. We're not in the green yet. So the green is great, good. That's usually what we in the Seattle area fortunately live with. Sometimes it's yellow, moderate, but even with the yellow, the recommendation is people who are sensitive, people who have chronic conditions, heart or lung, should really reduce prolonged or heavy exertion outdoors. We know with orange, again, it's reducing heavy exertion outdoors. When we move into both the red and purple, we have to realize that these pollutants are also coming inside. So not only are if we are trying to protect ourselves from outside, but we try to exercise inside, there is the potential that we are going to be inhaling these pollutants inside too. In um, preparing my talk, uh, which was actually over the last several weeks, but the fires have only been most recently, here is a, um, a diagram um, from Air Now. And you'll notice that on the September 14th, uh, it was at 241. And so that was very unhealthy. And you can see what the recommendation is, is that people should avoid any physical activity outdoors. And when I read more, there was some question about how much people should do indoors too, based on how high this uh, air quality was. And when I looked at this an hour ago, so this slide shows uh, September 17th at one o'clock, it is still unhealthy in Seattle. So again, the recommendation is Older adults, people with heart or lung diseases, children actually avoid any strenuous activities outdoors. This is even with masks on. Masks do not prevent all of this from being inhaled. And these are not cloth masks. I mean, cloth masks won't help in this way. Cloth masks, sure, with COVID, but with um, these kinds of particles, they're not helping protect it, the particles from going through your lungs. Okay. So my recommendation here is really keeping an eye on the air quality index to really determine when to start exercising. Highly recommend that. I never thought I would say don't exercise, but I think one really needs to weigh the risks associated with breathing the bad air and what that does permanently to your lungs. So when the air quality index is back to good, remember that's the first level, the most common form of physical activity that older adults would do would be actually walking. So I wanted to um, share with you two types of activity. Um, one is walking. Uh, this is something that older adults love to do. It's actually my preferred activity too. Um, it's really wonderful because you can do it at your own pace. You can do it alone or you can do it with others and there's not, um, there's no fees associated with it. Um, one of the questions we were asking was, could malls actually provide a safe and accessible venue? So we actually had a mall walking pro project that we worked on a couple of years ago. I'd be curious to know in the chat feature, are there any mall walkers in this particular group of 24 of you? Are there any mall walkers? Anybody walking in Northgate Mall, walking in Bellevue Square? Uh, anybody walking at the zoo? Okay. Well, let me briefly share with you. Um, mall walking is a great form of exercise. Um, we have found that one person gave a chat here. There's no more Northgate Mall. You're right, there isn't. Thank you for reminding me about that. There, ha there have been in the past. Um, there is zoo walkers though. Any zoo walkers there? And actually, I'm glad you mentioned about Northgate Mall because I'm really curious to know with their conversions, whether they'll be um, walking once they convert to their new businesses. Okay, so we actually did some um, research on malls. Um, this is when they were alive and well about three years ago. We wanted to see what was in, uh, uh, published. Um, we wanted to do some audits and we wanted to actually talk to mall walkers themselves. Um, so this was an exciting time in thinking about prospects for malls. Um, as you can see now, malls have not done well and we were very disappointed, but we had some interesting findings that I wanted to share with you. Uh, we actually looked at what was published about mall walking and we found over 37 studies. And what was great is that they used walking maps. Malls offered blood pressure checks. We found that older adults liked malls for walking. They were safe. 
They were accessible, they were well lit. Many of them had partnerships, either with senior housing or with hospitals, and that the results from people who did the mall walking is they found improved health. And interesting enough, the malls themselves liked building community. So we actually went and did some audits. So we went to malls and also just as importantly, we went to non-malls. So we went to situ places that had walking programs such as a Woodland Park Zoo such as um, uh, ice hockey rink up in Everett, uh, such as we were in Chicago too. We went to uh, the Botanical Gardens there. Uh, we were in Anchorage, Alaska. We went to some of the outdoor ice rinks that had walking around the outside. And we really looked at what was so appealing about them. Well, they had bus stops, they had parking, they had benches, they had working restrooms. There were um, security officers, so it was safe. So it was wonderful to look at what kind of assets there were. But I wanted to mention that we didn't just look at malls. As I mentioned, we looked at other venues and the Woodland Park Zoo does have a seniors walking program. It's not going on now based on the air quality index, um, but keep um, looking at the Woodland Park Zoo because there's a great uh, walking program there. Um, I know a number of the era living communities take um, buses over there. Um, and that's another um, way to maybe talk to your life enrichment directors to see if in fact um, they wouldn't be able to take you over to the zoo in a bus. Um, we ended up talking with walkers too and lots of things they were telling us it was a great sense of community. There was health, they felt safe. Um, so you can imagine to my chagrin when the malls started closing down. I am hopeful though that the mall structures will remain and the new businesses will welcome walkers back there. I, I don't know that for a fact, but I think they would still want to be in partnership with communities. Um, we also talked with um, program leaders. Um, these are individuals who partnered with hospitals um, and they too um, were enthusiastic about the sense of community. And we also talked then with Managers, and again, they liked having extra eyes on the ground, as they would say. They liked um, the fact that they could partner with communities and that their malls were linked with wellness. But clearly this wasn't part of their money-making adventure. Um, but again, the ability to work with community partners was important to them. Um, we were able to develop a mall walking program resource guide. Uh, this has been widely used throughout the country, um, and we hope that it can be used in other settings too, like I said, um, botanical gardens, Woodland Park Zoo, um, ice skating rinks, et cetera. Um, and the last program I wanted to share with you is Enhanced Fitness. Uh, that is a group exercise program that um, a number of the era living communities do offer. Um, it is evidence-based. I don't know if any of you are participating in Enhanced Fitness. If you wanted to let me know um, in the chat, that would be great. It's um, taught by certified instructors. It's a one hour class, three times a week. It is offered in various settings, not just in retirement communities, but also churches. Um, it's offered in healthcare organizations and community settings. And one of the nice things about it is in fact, um, there is science to support it. Um, it's good based on people's different frailty um, and we do have ongoing research for it. Um, the research shows us that those people who participate um, actually do better emotionally, socially, and physically than those people who would be in a control group who would have deteriorated and not been part of the program. Interesting enough, some of the original research also shows that enhanced fitness actually, the participants had lower healthcare costs. So we know that that's also an asset then. So in closing, um, I really wanted to thank you for your attention. I hope this has uh, caused some interest in you as far as once the air quality index has improved, that you would uh, return or start, <coughs> excuse me, a new physical activity program. So I'd be curious to know in chat if anybody wanted to volunteer um, something that you might be doing uh, once the air quality improves as far as the type of uh, physical activity you're hoping to get back to.
But I do hope that, um, again, after the air quality improves, uh, that you'll be able to uh, return to uh, the physical activity programs that you've been involved in. I realize also with the um, COVID, um, with pan the pandemic, uh, there have been changes in the program offerings, uh, just in order to both keep socially distanced, um, as well as uh, what is available both inside and outside. Um, so I wish you well as far as uh, either starting new or uh, resuming your physical activity routines. And I'm happy to take any questions now or comments. It looked like someone uh, responded in the chat group and they said they um, plan to do swimming walking, exploring, taking pictures. That's a great one. I, I like the diversity. Um, it is really important that we have uh, different types of physical activity. It helps with our different muscle groups. Um, so um, really appreciate uh, the, the variety there. And actually, I like the idea of taking pictures as you're going out walking, as long as you're not distracted. But it's a great way to capture uh, what you're seeing, as well as the various scenes. And we know Seattle is lovely with uh, the various uh, seasons that we have. All right. Well, I, I just want to take a quick moment um, uh, to thank you for joining us today, Dr. Uh, Belza, I know I think I speak for everyone in here today that we appreciate your time and for sharing your knowledge um, that you've presented. Uh, just want to give everyone a moment. Um, if you have any questions that they'd like to ask, um, you can ask them at this time. You can use the chat feature um, if you'd like. So I'll give it a few moments if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask. Um, I know I actually might have one for you, um, you know, with COVID-19 and all that's happening, um, your take on wearing masks while doing physical activity outside, um, any insight to that? Are you, should you wear a mask or should you not wear a mask? Um, that's a tough one. You should wear a mask yourself from COVID, yes. Um, um, if you are uh, socially distancing and walking on your own, that's a different story. Um, I would suggest you uh, take the advice of your community health nurses in your community. Any other questions at this time? All right, well, if there are no other questions, then I think we are just about ready to wrap up. So I am going to email a copy of today's slides, um, including the presenter's contact information. We're also gonna include a survey sheet that we'd like you to fill out to tell, uh, to tell us about your experience on today's Zoom presentation. As again, we are trying something new, experimenting with something new, um, and we wanna learn you know, what works, what doesn't. Um, and so with that being said, again, my name is Michelle Barnett. I'm the Community Relations Associate here at Aljoya Thornton Place. If you have any questions about our community, please feel free to reach out. And thank you so much for joining us today. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.